The Royal Society has organised this lecture at the Times Cheltenham Science Festival with the generous support of Winton Capital Management as part of the Society's public events programme. The Royal Society is a self-governing fellowship of some of the world's most distinguished scientists with the fundamental purpose of promoting and supporting excellence in science. The Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books is an annual prize that celebrates the best in popular science writing. The long list for the 2012 prize will be announced following this talk. This afternoon's speaker is Alex Bellos. Alex has a degree in mathematics and philosophy from Oxford University. He has worked for The Guardian in London and Rio de Janeiro, where he was the paper's unusually numerate foreign correspondent. In 2002, he wrote a critically acclaimed book about Brazilian football, and in 2006, Ghost wrote Pele's autobiography, which was a number one bestseller. Alex Bellos was shortlisted for the 2011 Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Bellos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming here. Um, I've just been presented with a new clicker, and this is my old clicker, which has got the thing to look at, so I'm going to try and use both hands and talk at the same time, so I apologise if I make mistakes. So, yes, this is the, my book, um, Alex's Adventures in Numberland, which came out about two years ago now and was uh, shortlisted last year for the Science Prize. I want to talk to you a little bit about it, a little bit about me, and th at the end, if anyone's got any questions of things that come up, because often when you're talking about numbers and math, there are things that people don't understand, very happy to um, answer any questions. Now, I started off writing about, well, studying maths and philosophy, then became a writer, and what I tried to do um, was bring this sense of sort of narrative and reportage to writing about um, the potentially dry subject of mathematics. Because I don't think that mathematics is, is dry at all. I think that even though we say that, that mathematics in some ways is, is um, sort of arcane and not related to what we do, it's so imbued with culture and history um, that you can't really talk about the history of the world without talking about the history of mathematics, and of numbers especially. Uh, for my book, because I, I was the Guardian's correspondent in Rio de Janeiro um, before I wrote this book, and so when I wanted to write about mathematics, my first thought was always pick up the telephone, call a travel agent, and fly to wherever I needed to be. So in the course of writing this book, I went to Japan, which I'll talk about, India, which I'll talk about. I also went to America several times, to France, to Germany. I corresponded with people all over the world to get this idea that it really is a, a geographical adventures that I had, and human adventures, rather than, obviously, the intellectual and the playful um, abstract adventures, too. Now, where do you start with when you want to write about numbers? Let's start with one. And what I want to recreate here is a famous, possibly the most famous experiment in numerical cognition, which is the sort of psychology of how we understand numbers. And what you do is that you show people a screen with a certain number of dots in it, and the person is um, <coughs> tied up to a timer, and they need to just say how many dots they see, and you register them at that amount of time. So I'm going to show you some dots, and I want you to shout out as soon as you can how many numbers you can see. OK, this is one, obviously. Two. Two. Three. Four. Five. <laughs> OK. A lot. A lot. <laughs> Give that man a job. OK, the point is, instant, 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 and then somewhere along the line, you need a bit of time. Where is that cutoff point where we stop seeing things instantly? And it turns out it's between three and four. So three is the largest number of things that we can subitize from subito, seeing something instantly. Because four, when there's four, we don't see it instantly. We actually need to start doing the counting. And the little bit extra that we need to do, the counting, adds on and on. Um, and eventually, when we get to here, it's uh, uh, you know um, a large measure. Even, it's measurable not just by sort of small precision instruments, but by us here in the room. Now, why might it be interesting that three is the maximum number that we can instantly understand without thinking, um, without counting? Well, let's look 
at these three numerals scripts from ancient India, about one and a half thousand years ago, China, these are the kanji characters, Chinese characters, um, for uh, the numerals one, two, three, four, and ancient Rome. And as you will see, hopefully everyone can see on the screen, one, two, and three can just be one, two, and three lines. Because we instantly, we're not going to confuse one with two, or two with three, or three with one. But you cannot have a system of symbols, which is supposed to be things that you see instantly, that has the four lines, because then we just wouldn't understand it. I mean, we would understand it, it would take us time, we'd be using the, sort of the, wrong, the wrong bit of our brain. So um, when you get to four, you need to have something else to make it stand out. Now, once I was giving one of these talks, I mean, this is quite an old building, but it was an even older building than this, and there was a massive um, kind of clock face, and it was all the numbers were in Latin. And I went round, and all of a sudden I thought, <gasps> four was one, one, well, I, 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 completely contradicting what I was saying up here. And I was thinking, I hope no one turns round. But actually, the clock completely proves my point, because it is the case that certain times in Rome, they did use I, 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 but in clock faces, obviously it's the position that gives away what the number is, and aesthetically, it's much nicer than I, V. Now, let's look at India closer. This is India about one and a half thousand years ago. One, two, three, four. Imagine writing this without taking your quill or whatever they had in India off, off the page, or if you're doing it in sand in the stick, without taking your stick off the floor, what you would get. You get that, and that is the origin of the numerals we have today, which we call them Arabic numerals, but actually that's a misnomer. They are Indian numerals. But the reason, and the reason they called Arabic numerals is that they started in India, and it was such a good system that then they went through the Arab lands because there weren't any, you couldn't get to Europe if you didn't go through the Arab, the Arab world of this way of writing one, two, three, four. There's nothing intrinsic about these numbers that makes Indian numerals <coughs> special. What is special is the zero, because India was where zero was, was invented, more than zero. You know, there's the old joke, what does India give in the world? Said by Indians, kind of ironically, what does, Indian ever, what does India ever give in the world? Nothing. <laughs> but actually, nothing is everything, because nothing is probably the greatest gift sort of for, for, you know, for modernity, for civilization that anyone has ever given. Any, any civilization has ever given humanity, because having zero, giving us a modern, robust, um, <coughs> easy to understand number system, really, it, it, was the, it was the number system with zero, the Indian number system, coming to Europe, which really kick-started the Renaissance. Um, and without that, you really couldn't do any science at all. Because what did we have before the Indian system? We had the Roman system. Have you ever tried to do a multiplication using Roman numerals? You don't want to try. Let me tell you, it's long and cumbersome. And actually, the only people who would do um, arithmetic in Roman times would be sort of professional. They'd be abacists, people who, who actually used an abacus. Because mathematics and numbers, and multiplication, things like that, were out of the range um, of ordinary people. Why did zero then make things much easier? Well, what zero brings, it brings a positional way of writing numbers, that the position tells you something about the number. So when we write, say, 11, right, so that's a bad example because it's a one and a one, say 21, two and a one, we know that that's one unit and two tens. And this is something very, very basic, but actually conceptually really advanced. Um, and when you have this positional system, you need a symbol for nothing in that position. And even though some cultures, like the Babylonians, had a positional system, and they did mark sort of a, a, a something when there was nothing in, in that column, they didn't treat it like a number. But when you treat it like a number, uh, mathematics, well, basic, basic arithmetic becomes accessible to everyone. So when uh, it was Leonardo of Pisa, or Fibonacci, wrote the first book introducing the system to Europe, it was like the latest thing was like the iPhone of the um, you know, 13th century. And for all of a sudden, people could start doing multiplications, additions, subtractions, as they wanted, and trade could grow, and then science could come out of that. And I want to just show this. You know, we tend to think that arithmetic is really dull. 
And I just want to show that actually behind arithmetic, there are some really sort of wondrous, fun things. And I've just got some nice little... Uh, <coughs> whoops. i to trip over my bag. It would be a bit silly. Bring this to the front, which shows the kind of genius of this positional system. And it's also quite fun. I'll turn it around. So let's say we want to multiply, say, 12 times 31. I'm going to do it by translating the numbers into lines. Okay, so 12 becomes 1, 2. Okay, that's 12. One line and two lines. This is 31. 1, 2, 3, and 1. Okay? Count the intersections. 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 1 is 7. And here, 1, 2, 3, 3. And that is the answer. Okay? You can do any multiplication you like by transferring them into lines and calculate, add, just adding up the intersections. Now, why does this work? This works because a number times another number is the same thing as how many intersections there are with that number of lines intersected with the other number of lines. So four times five, if you do four lines and then five lines, there's going to be 20 intersections. So, so th th these are sort of mini multiplications. And why are we adding, putting this one and this one, these two adding up put here and this one here, because just, just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it here, 12 times 31. Here, it's the 2 times 1. It's the unit times the unit. Here, it's the tens, tens times the units, and the units times the tens. OK? So it's 1 and 1 here, and 3 and 2 here. And this one here is these two here, right? So essentially, we're doing what's called um, cross-multiplication which is actually the quickest way of multiplying. So why is the multiplication called long multiplication at school? It's because there's a short multiplication, and this is the short multiplication. <laughs> right? Yeah, and if any ever, ever, ever wondered, if we don't know the long one, why can't we do the short one first? Because this is actually much faster, but you need to keep more in your head. You don't write it all out. And actually, this is how people used to do multiplication first. And it's, it's sort of argued, and it's probably one of the most likely reasons, that the reason why the X emerge as the multiplication sign was that this is exactly how multiplication was done. So that, that therefore, becomes the symbol for multiplying. And beyond that, this is just, like, really kind of cool. And you can do it with all different, all different types of number. It's not really big enough. You can do it with you know, 300. I can put a number here and do that. Um, the reason why it gets a bit cumbersome, and then you need to start carrying, because if you get more than 10, in the, with more than 9 here, you need to move to one over there. But still, it just shows that it's kind of like an X-ray of arithmetic using this Indian system. And it's, you know, we should sometimes just stop and think, this is a pretty amazing system and um, has been incredibly useful. Now, when I was, was writing my book, I thought, OK, so Indian invented zero, fine. How can I bring this out? And so what I decided to do, the first thing I had to do, was to fly to India. And so I flew to India to meet this guy here, who's the Shankaracharya of Puri. Now, there are four Shankaracharyas, one each, uh, one the north, the south, east, and the west, and he's in the east. Um, and they are sort of the most spiritual men of a very ancient type of Hinduism. I would sort of compare it to, say, something like the Archbishop of Canterbury or, or something like that, but, but you couldn't because the whole idea of kind of the Christian religion is this kind of hierarchy that goes up, whereas it's just nothing really the same um, in, in, in Hinduism. And so, and he also considers himself a mathematician and is outspoken about mathematics. So I thought, okay, why don't I go and ask him about India and zero and the culture of mathematics? So I went along, and even though he speaks perfect English, understands it, he's not allowed to communicate with me in English in his temple. So I had his disciple here who I had to speak English to. He would then translate it into Hindi. He would then translate it yeah, to him to Hindi. He would then reply in Hindi, and it would come back to me. So I didn't think I would learn about geometric progressions doing this, but I certainly did, because I would say something that took a few seconds. The Hindi mysteriously took twice or three times as long. The answer was five, ten minutes long. 
and double that for the answer that came back to me. So, you know, half an hour later from the answer to the question, I finally got something which has absolutely nothing to do with the question that I originally asked. <laughs> As I realised, this is a really stupid way to be trying to, you know, like the sort of science journalist wanting answers, tell me what it is, what about this? You're not going to get it. So I went several times to see him. The sessions lasted for hours. I wasn't really getting anywhere. And I ended up just kind of like zoning out. And actually zoning out was the best possible thing that I could have done because you know, I started to look at the Shankaracharya and think, he wears... He was always wearing exactly the same robe. And he, he, just, he, just, he has got a robe, that's all he's got. When I was trying to think, well, where does he live? Well, he lives in the room adjacent. There's no furniture, there's just a bed. He eats the same bland curry every day with no spices. He has no possessions, so much so that people were always giving him gifts. And they were just, as we, this was going on, people were just like, arriving and prostrating themselves and giving him a gift of a mango or of some fruit. And he'd just pick it up and he'd just give it to someone else. So... He has nothing, he wants nothing, he wears nothing, sort of he eats nothing, and I think he's like the embodiment of nothingness. And in fact, sort of, you know, Mr. Zero. If you, th you think about it, the reason why Zero appeared in India is because it is a mathematical interpretation of a mystical idea. The mystical idea of letting go, of, having, of, 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 of nothingness. You know, we tend to want stuff, but he doesn't want any stuff. Um, the mystical, the way of thinking of, of the East is this idea of giving everything away, of, of, of having nothing, because nothing is something, that having nothing is everything. And you know, brilliantly Im 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 embodied by him. You know, we didn't get that in, in the West because there was a void. Nothing was the void. We were afraid of the void, so we filled it with stuff. We filled it with God. But the idea that you can have nothing was actually kind of a cherished idea. And the zero that was chosen for the symbol of nothing, you think, well, I, as a kid, I used to think, yeah, zero is like a hole. There's like nothing there. I must have completely misunderstand the point. Zero is the eternal cycle of the faces of heaven, this idea that it's nothing, but it's everything. So we tend to often think that religion or mysticism, um, say superstition, and science are always in conflict. But actually... If it wasn't for this sort of mystical idea, we might never have had the zero. We might be you know, stuck in the dark ages because it was only, as I said before, really having a proper number system that got us out of the dark ages. Now, the Indian number system is about 1,500 years old. Before that, there were other number systems. Um, Roman had numerals. Um, the Jews had numerals. The Greeks had numerals. In fact, they were just the letters of, the, of, the, of, the, of their alphabet. The Phoenicians before that, the Egyptians. All the way back, well, where does it, what was the first system? Where were numbers invented? And you might think, well, as soon as we were humans, we always had numbers. But that's not true. Numbers are something that's really quite recent, only about 8,000 years ago. And it was invented in present-day Iraq, then called Sumer, by... I guess, you know, accountants or bookkeepers as a way of keeping track of things. So just say you are a shepherd and you have 20 goats. How do you communicate to your fellow shepherd that you have 20 goats without riding 20, uh, you know, having a stick with like 20 marks in it or having like 20 pebbles? There's, 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 there's no way where you need a word, but there were no words for it. There, were, there, there, there was no way of communicating it. So they invented a system of clay pieces with different symbols. And the different symbols actually referred to the number of things that there were. And this is really when you say this is when numbers invent. This is when the numbers started, because there were words and symbols for quantity, which did not exist before. And not only was this the beginning of numbers, but this was the beginning of all scripts. Because no scripts predate these first symbols written on clay tablets. So books, literature, words, well not words, but the written word really began with these, the accountants of Sumeria. Which I think is very ironic with people, you know, at school you have the you know, arts and science people. And the arts people are like, ah, well, why do we ever need any of your sort of numbers and things? Well, if it wasn't for numbers, if it wasn't for the need to 
tally, well, not to tally, they, they, they need to describe quantity, you would, all literature would, would, would not have happened. Now, what is a number? It's sort of obvious, it's just it's something that counts things, right? But actually, a number has two separate parts. Um, you might think it's just one part, but it's actually two separate parts. <laughs> That's the wrong click. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. So I've got one thing on this machine, and this is... All right, let's find it. Sorry about that. Rewind. Oh, yes, no, this is... This, this... Because I'm doing two um, computers, I can't say what's coming up. This was something that I found out when I was in India, which as well as inventing zero, they're the first country to have a zero rupee note, the zero currency <laughs> notes, which I thought was very funny. And basically, the reason why they have this is because it's an anti-corruption device. That because there's also corruption there, you bribe someone with nothing. And I thought this is sort of historically brilliant because it's using that same thing, that nothing is something. OK, what is a number? Number has two different aspects. It has cardinality and it has ordinality. Oh, is that right? Sorry. Yes, I can. I can put it all back. I won't need that anymore. Yeah, what is a number? It has two things. It's cardinality and ordinality. Can you still look? You know, you can't see it. I'm going to have to take this down and put it here. OK. All right. Cardinality and ordinality. Amount and position. Um, so what are these? Amounts. So just say there are four chairs on the front row. That's four. Okay, that their amount of chairs is four. When I count to ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, nine, ten, I'm not counting uh, objects. I'm just it's just an ordered list. And four is just what comes after three and before five. And these are two completely different ideas melded in the idea of number that we take for granted. But actually, they're different. So I thought, well, how can I try and explain this in the way which is like an interesting story? Um, the fact that they are different. And then when I realized, when I discovered my research, that there are some non-humans who have learned to count. And the best of these are the chimpanzees of Kyoto University. I called up my travel agent and I flew to Japan and went to interview, or to speak, to the scientist and to see the chimpanzees counting their numbers. Now, how does a chimpanzee learn to count? Well, you need to teach it ordinality and cardinality. And how do you do that? Well, in Japan, they did it using touchscreen computers and with reward-driven tasks. So they'd have to do a task by sort of touching the screen. And if it would be correct, a little bit of food would come down, go bing, and a bit of food would come down. They'd eat it and thought, this is great. I want to do this again. If they got it wrong, it would go, ah, and no food would come. And quickly, this way, they understand what they need to do, what to do to get the task right. And there have been, you know, in the 1970s, there was a lot of interest in sort of chimpanzees and how intelligent they are. I don't know if anyone saw the film um, the Nim, Chim Nim Chimpsky, Nim, Project Nim, about the chimpanzee. Well, that's basically in the West, we were really fascinated by whether the chimps could learn language, and basically they can't, and the sort of tragic tale of that is in that film. But whereas in Japan, they were much more interested in something they could quantify, so they tried to teach chimpanzees numbers. So for cardinality, what they did is that they would show different boxes with different numbers of things in them, and then they'd show the Arabic numerals. So just say when there was a th three, so there'd be three boxes. One had one thing in it, one had two things in it, one had three things in it. Then there was a three. The chimpanzees had to touch the box with three things in it to get the reward. And very quickly, they got this. So you could put a box with a certain number of objects in, and they would just tap the correct digit. Um, so you say, yes, they understand cardinality. <laughs> For ordinality, how do they do it? They put two numerals up randomly, so three and six, and they had to touch the lowest one, then the highest one, in order to get the reward. And they got that quite quickly. In a couple of years, the chimpanzees, you could say, could count, because they understood the cardinality and the ordinality of the numbers from one to nine. And then one of the academics at the University of Kyoto said, do you know what, we haven't taught them zero. Let's do this, but let's teach them the cardinality and work out if from the cardinality of the number, they can work out the ordinality of it. In other words, by explaining that zero is nothing, there are no things in the box, if you can deduce that this means that zero, which is obvious, is, before, is below one. Because obviously, 
It, for us, it, it's, sec it's second nature. So they teach it first, the cardinality of zero. They have a box with nothing in it. And very quickly, they realize, when the box got nothing in it, it's a zero. When it's a zero, it's the box with nothing in it. And then they thought, OK, now let's do the ordinality tasks. And sometimes there'll be a zero. So there'll be this strange thing, this, 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 this strange symbol. And by learning, out, learning when they get it right and when they get it wrong, they'll deduce when, 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 where it is. But also, surely, by having an understanding, sorry, it wouldn't be strange at all, because they've learned this symbol from the cardinality task, where it should be. So they did this a few dozen times. And sometimes the chimpanzee got it right. Sometimes the chimpanzee got it wrong. Basically, whenever a zero appears, you've got to press it first. It's always going to be below us. It makes sense. Um, and they average it out. And where do you think the chimpanzee thought zero was in the order of numbers? Yeah, between six and seven. So not even in the middle, slightly higher. In other words, they had absolutely no idea. It was pretty much random. The more and more they did it, they sort of think, OK, when it's with this, it, we've got to press it first, et cetera, et cetera. It went down and down and down. But they never totally understood that it was less than one. It was almost like round about one after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tasks. So essentially, what, what I think this shows is that the ability to effortlessly move between ordinality and cardinality is kind of a sense of, sort of what really makes us human. It's what our brain can do. It's what we do without thinking. But... The, our nearest sort of relatives, the chimpanzees, cannot, just do not understand it at all. And I think that's, you know, it's interesting to, you know, we study chimpanzees to really learn about ourselves, that we sort of can isolate what, you know, what, what our skills are. Now, after spending, you know, a decade or so teaching these chimpanzees digit uh, numbers, they had, they thought, well, we need to do something with them. And so they started giving them other tasks, and we're going to show you some of these other tasks that they did with you know, the world's most numerous chimpanzees. And if you've never seen it before, it's really, really quite stunning. So what they did is that they, would get a sh they showed five random digits on a screen, and then after a, a certain amount of time, the digits became white squares. So you could just see five white squares. And the task is you need to remember the numerical order and tap the numerical order. So they started doing this with a human-controlled group and some chimpanzees, and they did it for 0.65 seconds. So these five digits would appear on the screen for 0.65 seconds, then become the white squares. At 0.65 seconds, humans can do it pretty much all the time. Chimpanzees can do it all the time, get it correct. Then they lessen the time for 0.43 seconds. At 0.43 seconds, humans are starting to make lots of mistakes. Chimpanzees has no effect. Then they bring it down to what I'm going to show you now, which is 0.21 seconds. This is a chimpanzee. You can see, in fact, if I press it, that's a chimpanzee's head. That's the computer. That's not a zero. That's the button that he presses to start. Five digits are going to appear on the screen for 0.21 seconds. So you won't see it the first time. It's almost too fast for a human to understand. And let's see if the chimpanzee can get it correctly. He gets the food from the side. Press it. You see those digits? His face doing it totally effortlessly, loving the food. And they enjoy doing this so much that. I don't know if you've ever met people who work with chimpanzees because they sort of, because we're so, they personify the chimpanzees so much that you can't, they call them students and the lab is the classroom and it's all kind of a bit odd. But the chimpanzees love it so much that at nine o'clock every day for class, they're waiting. <laughs> because then the door opens, literally they're waiting there to, to, to do this. And um, I, come out, I said to, to the guy who's, who's running it, this is a Japanese guy, and I said, well, don't some days it's just, like, really nice, they just can't be bothered to come in for class? <laughs> and he just didn't understand the question. <laughs> I'm thinking, we, you know, we've got a lot to learn from our Japanese education. He said, well, why would you not want to go to class? <laughs> um, but also, you think they're really smart, but they're not so smart, because all the food that they win is discounted from their 
what they would get for lunch. So otherwise, they just the clever ones would get really huge. There'd be a huge obesity epidemic. It doesn't work. So, but they haven't clicked on that. So that was point, five digits for 0.21 seconds. And it was taken a few years ago. Now they can do eight digits at 0.21 seconds, or five digits at 0.09 seconds. So less than half that. And they still get it more right than they do wrong. And you know, obviously the reason why that's the case is this is certain skills that they need in the wild that we don't need anymore, and you need to lose some skills to gain others. And to find out more, I guess I, there's, there's probably some evolutionary biologist giving a talk. <laughs> Go and see that talk, and let's continue. Um, one more video of the chimpanzees, and something else interesting happens. It's exactly the same task. Five digits, 0.21 seconds, he's doing it. All of a sudden, he hears something. There's a noise behind him. He turns around, and for 10 seconds, is looking away. Comes back. <laughs> Slower, but he definitely remembers it. So this skill that they have, and then just keeps on going. This sort of photographic memory lasts for at least 10 seconds. And, you know, is absolutely unbelievable. And this was, it's not strictly mathematics, but it was through this use of numbers that the um, animal psychologists sort of discovered really the first kind of intellectual skills that chimpanzees have that are greater than sort of or cognitive capacities they have that are greater than ours, which before people thought that, well, basically anything they can do, we can do better. Now, I went to Japan to speak to the scientists and to, to, to meet the chimpanzees. And when I was in Japan, I didn't want to just do that because Japan is like paradise for a sort of a math or a numbers lover. There's so many interesting things out there. And I went on a kind of two-week maths tour of Japan. And this is what I want to talk to you a little bit about now. Because even though you know, math is the same, numbers are the same everywhere, the culture of mathematics and the approaches to mathematics is, 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 is very, very different. And a very simple way, hang on, get the right clicker, is, say, tallying. So tallying is what we did before we had numbers, you know, we, if we wanted to sort of tally on um, sticks or maybe on a, on a cave or something, it, you can't really call it a number. It's just it's like a one-to-one -one correspondence with things. And the way we tally, one, two, three, four, five, the five-bar gate. And I just assumed that, you know, this is kind of almost something, um, you know, comfortingly sort of caveman about that we still count like this. It's more convenient to count like this. I just assumed that everyone... Everyone all around the world did it. But I was completely wrong. In South America, this is how you tally. One, two, three, four, five. And this is a much, much better system. Because as we said before, you want to have symbol, which you instantly can see what it is. And here, three and four are obviously different, as is five. Whereas when you're doing the five by eight, three and four, the four is, is you know, you're losing precious time there. Now, in the Far East, Japan, China, and Korea, they don't do either of these two ways. They tally like this. One. What do you think the second one's going to be? Coming down. Third one? Third one. Fourth one. Here. The fifth one. When I first found out about this, I thought, you want to, you know, what a way to put people off counting. <laughs> this is so complicated. But actually... It's the character for the word correct. So it's a bit, it's like poetry. It's like using numbers and words and language together to make both a bit more interesting and entertaining. And if you don't believe me, the next time you go into a, a Chinese or Korean or Japanese restaurant and you ask for, say, three or four beers, they'll draw those things. And they, 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 they all do. Um, and I think that actually the approach that the Japanese um, and the Chinese and Korean, although I didn't go there, but I know it's pretty much the same, have towards numbers. You know, we have a, a lot to learn. And um, there's a sort of different approach. It's basically all about embracing language and making maths more fun. For example, you learn your times tables in Japan. It's called a thing called the kuku, okay, because ku is nine. And they almost teach children the lines of the kuku before they tell them what it means. And they have changed some of the words in the cuckoo to make it scan better. 
And sometimes when there are two words, um, so one can be in or itchy. They choose the right ones at the right time to make it sound more like a kind of poem, more like a nursery rhyme. And when the children learn it, they sort of, it's, a, it's like sing-along, it's a bit like a rap. So it's really entertaining to see. When I went into school and said, could someone sing me, the, tell me the cuckoo, they were all like lining up. And they were sort of absolutely loving doing it. And my interpreter, I don't speak Japanese, was saying, you know, I've never thought about it, but when I have to multiply, say, six times seven, I'm remembering the music of the line of the cuckoo in my head, and then there's 42. And it seems that by associating numbers with words and with music and making it fun, it actually sticks there. And you know the Japanese, in terms of basic arithmetic skills, are much better, you know, better better than we are. Um, but the real oh, sorry, I forgot to talk about him because it's a different thing. The other thing that I did, I met this guy, Machi, uh, Mag, Maki Kaji, who is the guy who coined the phrase Sudoku, and found the small unheard of puzzle in an American puzzle magazine that no one was bothered about and turned it into a kind of national craze in Japan. And I thought when I was going to meet him, you know, he's, the, he's a puzzle maker, businessman, Japanese. I thought, this guy's going to be a bit nerdy, right? He was the coolest dude I've ever seen. He, like, Nicoli has company because he spends all his money gambling. He's got his John Lennon specs. He was smoking, he's wearing jeans. He was... It was just interesting because you wouldn't really get someone like that in this country, someone who was so unashamedly into aren't numbers cool, being so kind of rock and roll. And he's talking about, yeah, I'm so glad I made my money when I was later because otherwise it would have all gone on geisha girls and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said to me, Alex, I want to show you my new hobby. I've got this new passion. And I was like, okay. And he said, what I'm, like, what I'm doing now I'm taking the photographs of car license plates. And I was like, what? And he said, you know, and he got me a couple. And he showed me. And I've got a copy of my, of the American version, of my book, which I'll give to anyone who can tell me why he might have wanted to take pictures of these license plates. Mathematically, what is interesting about them? Can anyone see? Yeah, give, come and get the book. Well done. Okay. <laughs> Basically, it's the times tables. Three times five is 15, four times one is four, which means there are 81 separate types of Japanese license plate that have a line of the times table. And he thought, wouldn't it be fun to try and just get the whole set? And when I get the whole set, I could have an exhibition. And I just thought, this is someone who, you know, we see numbers all the time, all around us. We're kind of bombarded by numbers. But actually, just to think, yeah, they're quite fun and quite cool. And let's sort of, let's play around with them. I think that that's sort of it's really sort of refreshing and fun. But the real difference between how it, people in Japan approach numbers differently to how we do in the West is the abacus. I don't know if anyone has seen an abacus before or used an abacus. Essentially, it's a calculating machine. Um, it's been used... Basically every, almost every culture has got some kind of abacus-type um, device, and this is the Japanese abacus called the, the soroban, which is identical to the Roman abacus, and each rod is a digit, and there are only, there are exactly 10 positions of beads per rod, so each rod is going to be digits, so it's kind of, it's horizontal, so gravity isn't working, so the first four is zero, that's the default position, one bead up is one, two beads up is two, three beads up is three, four beads up is four, then for five, you've got to put all those beads back down, and the top one goes down. So it's almost kind of like base five, and then you do six, seven, eight, nine. Now, once you learn how to play the, how to, to do the abacus, addition is so easy that just by putting the number in, you've, you, you've added it to what was before. And multiplication, because multiplication is just repeated addition, becomes very easy, and quite soon you can start to do square roots, um, divisions, you know, really complicated multiplications, really fast. You think, well, big deal. We've got electric cal electronic calculators these days. Well, in Japan, oh, pressing the wrong one <laughs> here, in the 1970s, they, when they're coming out with 
electronic calculators. They brought one of these. And you would have thought, oh, it's to do on the abacus, then check with that that we got it right. But actually, it was the opposite reason they were using it. They were, didn't really trust this electronic thing. So they would put it in the electronic side and then just work out that it had made a mistake by doing it on the abacus as well. Um, because you can multiply incredibly quickly using an abacus. Now, you do not need to learn the abacus for your schoolwork in Japan. Even so, a million Japanese every year go to abacus club. There are 20,000 abacus clubs all over Japan, and they happen in the afternoon, and you go... So Monday, you might go to uh, swimming practice, Tuesday to violin practice, and say Wednesday, you'd go to abacus club. And all you do in abacus club... Um, and I went on to one, is just like learn how to use the abacus to calculate. And, you know, there are clocks, stopwatches there, so you can do it as fast as possible. And it's kind of amazing that they, you know, why they do that. And I can remember asking one of the guys who teaches there, and I said, um, why, what's, what's the point of learning how to calculate very fast with an abacus? And he looked at me and he just said, what is the point of running for 26 miles as fast as you can? When do you ever need to do that? <laughs> if it's something that you can do, the human body or the brain or the muscle can do, just try and do it as, as best as possible because it, it's sort of fun. It's incredibly competitive. And when you get good at the abacus, you are judged in dans, just like you are in the martial arts. And I went along to an abacus competition. That's one. And they have municipal, regional, and national championships. Actually, in August, I'm going to go back to Japan for the first time and go to the... To, to, to do a program, actually, on the abacus, uh, the, the national abacus tournament. And so it's, it's, it really is quite a big deal. And these are the kids. They've got their, their numbers on, and they're doing it. And essentially, the guy's at the front saying 5,322 times 600, and, you know, but doing it much faster, a bit like a horse racing commentator. There's the numbers, and all they're doing is trying to do it as fast as possible. Um, that, that, that's the, what he's doing. And when you win, you win these fantastic winged figures holding abacuses. <laughs> and another reason why they do it in Japan is that the abacus is called soroban, and the phrase for reading, writing, arithmetic is yomi, kaki, soroban. So it's reading, writing, abacus. So one of the reasons why they're doing it is that it makes them feel very Japanese. But the other reason is that it really seems that learning like this, the kind of slightly sort of visceral way of counting, is fun and entertaining. And it didn't seem that these kids that I was meeting were especially kind of introverted or nerdy or like numbers people. It was just kind of everyone was doing it, and they were all getting something out of it. Now, this is Yoji Miyamoto, the teacher there. And he said, when you get very good at the abacus, there's another Japanese thing called anzan, which is you, the imaginary abacus. You do not need the abacus anymore, right? Because you imagine an abacus in your brain and you move the beads in your brain. I said, well, yeah, I don't get it. What do you mean? And he got one of his pupils and he said, gave them a complicated multiplication. And the guy just said the answer. And I said, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, in my brain, I've got nine, row, uh, nine rods and all the beads on it, and I just moved the beads. I thought, wow, this is kind of interesting. And Miyamoto wanted to sort of promote this idea of Anzan calculating with the imaginary abacus, that he invented this game where the only way to solve it is, is, is with Anzan. Because if I were to give you a sum, you could solve it by putting it in Google, putting it in a calculator, you know, uh, pen and paper, you could put pebbles on the beach. But if the numbers are flashed at you so fast that you can't write them down, the only way of doing it is by straight off in your brain using, using, the, um, using Anzan. So I'm going to show you now this is um, one of well, his, his pupils doing this thing called Flash. Hang on. Flash Anzan. I need to. OK, it's a bit dark, which is why we had transferred to the other one, because something to do with my computer it makes it all dark. But basically, what you can see there is a computer screen. And on it are going to flash 15 digits in three seconds. And if anyone is really good at this, can you shout out what the answer is before the Japanese guy does? <laughs> 50 digits in three seconds.
Yeah, he got it right first time. Okay, what he's doing, he can't remember any of the intermediate sums. He sees the very first digit as a position on his imaginary abacus. The second one comes in, he just chains it, changes it, and he has an intermediary sum. But he can't remember it, and he just keeps on adding. And when he gets to the end, he just like reads what's in his brain, but can't remember any of the numbers. Um, and this has become like huge in Japan. There are TV programs with sort of the best people in Japan and screaming fans, and you can get it on your Nintendo DS and. If you were to put, if you Google Flash Hands, there are loads of sites that are teaching you how to do this. Um, and would it be wonderful if in the UK people would like wanted to rush home to practice their imaginary abacus? <laughs> now, the other interesting thing about the abacus is that, um, without going into too much detail, you know, the brain has kind of two hemispheres, and the left hemisphere is language, processing, and numbers, and mathematics. And the right brain is kind of visuospatial type things. Um, it turns out that with the abacus, you're learning numbers using the right side of the brain, when normally you'd be using the left side of the brain. So it's a completely different part of the brain when they do these tests of what the, you know, the neurons that are firing up. And what this means, or one way of, of showing an outcome of this, is that it's possible to do flash anzan because your left side brain is completely free to play a language game at the same time. OK, so this is the final slide uh, now. It is 30 digits being flashed at you in 20 seconds while playing a language game. And the language game that the two girls, the two 10-year-old girls are playing, it's called shiritori. And the first person says shiritori, and the last syllable is ri. So the next person needs to start a word beginning with the, that syllable ri. Then the first person needs to start the, her second word, or the, which would be the third word, starting with the last syllable of the word before and carry on. And let's see whether they... Yeah, uh, no. Why is, why is... Yeah, here we are. 30 digits in 20 seconds, whilst playing Shiritori word game. <laughs> and they got it perfectly right. And this was the first it was the first take, likewise with the previous one. I was there visiting them and they said, Oh yeah, we could do this thing, and so I said, Okay, can I film it? And he let and he let me film it. And you know, absolutely amazing. And you know, to conclude, really, the abacus is like the oldest and very first mathematical kind of pocket calculator, mechanical calculating device that we have. Yet, it is still, in many ways, the most versatile. Um, just before I finish, um, I just wanted to, because I'm, so I wrote my first book, and I'm writing a second book, and one of the things I'm doing with the second book, I'm trying to, I'm doing a survey, okay, that's me, which is on randomnumbersurvey.net, so I would just ask you, when you go home, if you could just, get the, um, it just asks you one question, and just like you to answer that one question, and it, that'd be great, because the more people that do it, the better my results are going to be. So thank you very much for the talk. And if anyone has any questions, or um, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> yeah? When you were talking about the sort of spiritualism of the number zero, yeah, um, I was reminded because I'm, I'm quite interested in I, I don't know a lot about it, but I'm quite interested in Pythagorean numerology and okay. the number of zeros in your numerological birth chart is meant to show your spirituality, your innate spirituality, and I wondered a whether you rate numerology at all as meaning anything, and um, whether this is something that it means something to you. Um, I don't believe in numerology personally because I don't believe in astrology because, you know, prove it to me and then I'll believe it sort of thing. Um, as a, I would have thought 90% of the rational, rationalist people would, would, would agree with me. But, yeah, I think that 
And in fact, one of the things that I'm trying to research for my next book is, is what numbers mean to different people. And I had a previous server I did last year, which was www.favoritenumber.net. OK, you can still go on to it. It's ongoing. And so far, I've had 35,000 people from all around the world um, just put in what their favorite numbers are and why. And so gradually, I'm getting this idea of that, you know, if it was totally random, there would be some numbers that were, you know, uh, all numbers would, would, would get a fair crack of the wick, so to speak. But they're not. Some numbers are much more popular than others. And I'm interested in why that is, but not necessarily because of spirituality between them. We think, oh, yeah, I like three because it's a religious number. Um, I think that there are, you know, we tend to not like round numbers, and we like precise numbers. We tend to prefer odd numbers to even numbers. And I'm interested in, like, the psychology behind why that may be. And, you know, there is, say, the spinal tap joke, which is turning something which is 10 up to 11, because then it gets louder than everything that's 10, which is all quite funny. But then... What was the marketing campaign behind, say, Levi's 501 jeans? It's like 500, but one better. And so subconsciously, we take all these interesting cues about numbers, and some of them are spiritual and religious and mystical, but some of the others are sort of mathematical. And I guess one of the things that I'm interested in is to try to find out sort of where the, the boundaries lie. Yes, sir? Everything you were saying earlier was uh, related, as far as I could see, to numbers to base 10. Yes. Uh, do you know why and when base 10 started to be the world standard and why yeah. it wasn't the more sensible 12? Right. Well, yeah, I could, I could talk for a whole, uh, a whole lecture on the duodecimals because, mathematically speaking, it's true, having 12 digits is more sensible than having 10. It's, so the reason why I have 10 digits is because of this. We've got uh, an purely anatomical reasons. But if we had 12 digits, we would, there would be 12 single digits, and one zero would be 12. And the reason why that is a better idea, and in the 19th century, famous sort of philosophers and uh, you know, philanthropists were trying to argue to bring it in, uh, this due decimal idea with 12 digits, is because it makes your times table's much easier, OK? And for people that don't know why, in base 10, which is the system we have now, what are the two, most, the two easiest times tables? Two and five. Have you ever realized that, well, 10 doesn't count, and one doesn't count? Because 10 is, that's already the base. And the base is always easy, because you just add another zero. So between one and 10, it's two and five. Have you ever thought that two and five is 10? The reason why the two times table and the five times table are really easy is because they're both factors of 10. You know, you can multiply them into 10. If we had 12 digits, the easiest times tables would be the three times table, the four times table, no, sorry, the two times table, the three times table, the four times table, and the six times table, because two, three, four, and six all divide into 12. So, the two times table is easy, and the five times table is easy now because it's just two, four, six, eight, zero, then put a one. Two, four, six, eight, put a one. So a two. And five is five, 10, 50, 20. If we had 12 digits, now bear with me, the three times table would be three, six, nine, one, zero. Then one, three, one, six, one, nine, two, zero. Two, three, two, six, two, nine, two, zero. So it would be obvious if a number is divisible by three, or how to, how to get there in the same way that it's obvious numbers divisible by two or divisible by five. The four times table would be four, eight, zero. One, four, one, eight, two, zero, et cetera. The six times table, two. So if we, we go to the geodecimal system, uh, we would have four more useful times table for three. So it would be easier. But, uh, but actually, changing to geodecimal would be kind of completely crazy <laughs> because when you start to try and work it out, it's so confusing, and the system we have works pretty well. I think we're kind of running out of time, so maybe approach me afterwards if you've got any more questions. Oh, quickly, one last question, and then... Well, 
Well, the abacus is not actually in the education system. It's in a kind of recreational education, if you see what I mean, in the same way that you know, learning a musical instrument or get, getting good at sport. But I definitely think there is something to be learned because the kids who are doing it are enjoying it. Yeah. But also what you have in Japan, you have Kumon. And lots of J Japanese, you know, the parents, half the, well, probably more parents send their kids to Kumon after school than they do at the abacus. So I guess it depends what kind of parent you are. If you want someone which is something which is very targeted towards passing exams, and the abacus is not targeted towards passing exams, but it probably improves concentration and it's just a bit more fun. Okay, thank you. And Jasper. Thank you. You, you are signing afterwards, aren't you? You are signing afterwards, aren't you? Um, Alex is signing afterwards, and you can buy his books and everything, not just the number book, but also the football book, which I re highly recommend. Even for someone who hates football, like me, um, I can't stand it. But read this. It's not about football. It's about Brazil. And if you like South America or Brazil or whatever, uh, please have a look at that as well. So, really, it's just a thanks to the Royal Society for, uh, for um, uh, bringing this event, of course, uh, for Alex for talking, and also for you good ladies and gentlemen uh, for attending. Thank you very much indeed. And Alex will be signing books um, in, the, in the tent or the room or whatever afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.